So even some of the stuff that, that we think declines over time, we're starting to find ways around it. But Scott's really right. His point is you can sort of bypass a lot of the, the things that decline over time uh, with sort of a flow mastery based protocol. And if you want to fight off Alzheimer's and dementia, we know that the two best ways to do it is lifelong learning and you need expertise and wisdom. Right. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Stephen Kotler to the show. Stephen is the executive director of the Flow Research Collective. He's an award-winning journalist and one of the world's leading experts on human performance. Stephen is the author of 11 bestsellers, including The Art of Impossible, The Rise of Superman, Bold, and Abundance. His work has been nominated for two Pulitzer Prizes, translated into over 50 languages, and he has appeared in over 100 publications. His latest book is called Nar Country, Growing Old, Staying Rad. Our moderator for this live discussion was Dr. Tori Higgins, the head coach of the Flow Research Collective. Dr. Higgins is a deeply passionate, empathetic peak performance coach, consultant, and educator whose coaching philosophy is rooted in the deep-seated belief that everyone has the potential to achieve success and growth. In her private practice, she has had the opportunity to coach a diverse range of clientele, from mountaineers preparing to summit Mount Everest and K2 to business leaders of Fortune 500 companies. In this live discussion, I talked to Stephen Collar about creativity, skill mastery, and aging. Our society views aging as a process of decline, with our physical and mental capabilities worsening over time. Stephen Collar invites us to challenge our preconceived notions about aging by engaging in impossible activities that cultivate mastery and creativity. When we are able to incrementally push past our limits, We change our mindset about growing old, which ultimately prolongs our longevity. We also touch on the topics of exploration, play, social connection, flow, neuroscience, wisdom, and embodied cognition. It's always a pleasure to jam with Steven about these topics. We nerd out a lot in this discussion, as we always do, but I hope you learn something new, especially relevant to those who are after the age of 40 and still want to stay rad. (laughs) So without further ado, I bring you Steven Cutler. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us. We are all rolling in. Uh, We are about to take a deep dive into the science behind peak performance, aging, skill mastery, creativity, so much more. Who knows where we're going to go with these two. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Tori Higgins. I'm the head coach at the Flow Research Collective, and I have the opportunity tonight to moderate what's sure to be a phenomenal, maybe sometimes ridiculous conversation between these two legends. We've got 11-time bestselling author, founder and executive director of the Flow Research Collective, and one of the world's leading experts in human performance, Stephen Kotler. Stephen, hey, how are you? Hi, everyone. Thanks for nice joining us. Nice to see a lot of friends in the chat. We have a lot um, of friends. Thank, thank you all for showing up. It's nice to see a bunch of familiar faces and a bunch of new faces. So hello to everybody. Awesome. We are also joined by none other than Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, also known as SBK. He's a cognitive scientist and a humanistic psychologist who explores the depths of human potential. He's a professor at Columbia University and the director of the Center for Human Potential. And he's authored 10 books, most recently Choose Growth. So if you're keeping count, we're up to over 20 books between these two guys. Uh, He's also the host of the Psychology Podcast. Hey, SBK, how are you? Hey, great to see you and great to be here today. Awesome. Well, thank you both for taking the time to hang out with all of us. Uh, We thought now would be a great time for a call about growth, peak performance, aging, creativity for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's only February, we're still at the beginning of 2023. And since FRC is a peak performance research and training organization, we wanna support as many people as possible in designing their next year of life to get as much of the good stuff out as possible. So this calls an excellent time to talk to world leading experts to gain some great recommendations on how to do just that. The second reason that this is great timing for a call on all these topics is that Steven's new book, in our country, Growing Old and Staying Rad is coming out at the end of this month. And this is a book about goals, grit, progression, especially in the second half of our lives. And you can think of this as a how not to book, how not to lose that brash fire, how not to give in to that cozy blanket of middle age, how not to go gently into that good night. So today, Stephen's going to be sharing some of the peak performance aging lessons that he learned while writing and living in our country. And we're going to be exploring how these lessons align with SBK's work on self-actualization, creativity, skill mastery, 
Let's get into it. Stephen, can you kick things off just by unpacking the title of your new book, Dark Country? What's it all about? For, uh, for, for those who haven't heard me say it, uh, NAR country, NAR is short for gnarly. It is action sports slang for, uh, an action sports slang as colorful as it is, is very precise because people are, are, are performing in like environments where shit goes wrong. You could, you could die. So the language as colorful as it is, is actually very precise and NAR, um, is defined and gnarly is defined as any environment, any situation high in perceived risk and high in actual risk. Country is any landscape or terrain, fictitious or real. And the book is obviously about peak performance aging. And it turns out that in our country is both sort of a great description of our later years, high in perceived risk and high in actual risk. And also, uh, as I'm sure we're gonna, we're gonna kind of talk about along the way, it's a really good sort of way of thinking about the, the gritty mindset required to totally thrive during our later years. Um, so uh, that's the title. And uh, gar in our country, growing old, staying red. There we go. So can you talk a little bit? So in this book, you call just massive BS, essentially, on the slow rot theory of mm -hmm. aging. Can you talk a little bit about some of just the latest research in neuroscience that supports that thriving in our later years of life is actually possible? There's a bunch of it. I, the, the big picture is I, is, I think, where you always want to start with this, which is the dominant theory of aging of the for the 20th century was this long, slow rot theory. And the irony of the long, slow rot, the idea behind the long, slow rot theory is that all our mental skills and all our physical skills decline over time. And there's nothing we can do to stop the slide. And um, it turns out none of that's true. In fact, the origin story for that is is Freud something Freud writes, it's 1904, he's about to turn 50 and he's terrified. And he writes that, don't even, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, don't even try psychotherapy in anybody over the age of 50. Their brains are too calcified, quote unquote, old people are no longer educable, right? This is the origin of the old dog can't learn new tricks idea. And it's sort of the foundation of the long slow rot theory. And it turns out that we didn't know this until starting in 1995 is when the data started piling up. Um, None of it's true. Almost everything. There are some exceptions, but almost everything that we thought declined over time, we now know are use it or lose it skills. So if you never stop training these skills, you get to hang on to them and even advance them far later in life than anybody thought possible. So that's sort of the big picture. And Scott, you just, I, I'm aware that you recently just finished NAR Country too. Chime in here. What was your, what was your initial take? Because I love that Stephen is kind of flying in the face of this, what we used to think about aging and, you know, the progress, the progress that we make as we grow older. Yeah. Um, thanks for this opportunity to offer some of my reflections on this book, because I have a lot of reflections on it. Um, when I read it, I, you know, you, it's kind of book, first of all, you just read top to bottom. You don't, you know, no, there's no break. <laughs> like you're, you're like on the edge of your seat to see like, what's, what, how's he going to fall next or <laughs> <laughs> which, which, <laughs> bone, which bone is he going to break? Um, you know, cause you want, that's part of the story, but, but there's something that really struck me. Um, first of all, the book was, was really inspiring to me. Um, it, I'm I'm not as old as Stephen, but I'm getting I'm catching up to him, and I'll be there soon. And um, even at at my age, I there are certain things that I have like limiting. I know that I have limiting mindsets, you know, about certain things, and I don't want it. You know, I have certain things like, oh well, you know what? It's I'm too old to do that. I'm too old to do. You know, it's too late to to get back to being good at basketball. Friends, I used to play basketball in like high school and middle school, and there's a lot of things. But so the book was very inspiring to me. Um, but what struck me about Stephen's mindset is that he, what I saw was an iterative process where he would have a gritty mindset and then he would face reality, <laughs> and 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 then he would say. But this is the cool thing about Stephen, which which really inspired me, is he would he kind of has this attitude. Like if I could sum up the whole book with one motto, I decided I would sum it up by saying, "There's always tomorrow." And I think that is kind of that could have been like the title of his book was "There is always tomorrow," because I found Stephen would be like, "Oh, what's a 53 year old doing?" You know, he would have all the self critical beliefs, and then he would reframe that. And then in some cases you would try it and it turned out his self-limiting beliefs were correct. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> which is what I thought was awesome about this book is, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of bullshit with the kind of these kinds of books where they say, oh, you can believe anything you want if you just put, you know, the seat, you know, or if you just attract it. No, Stephen, what was cool about uh, Stephen's mindset in this book is that it was it was it was it was um, he's always trying to push the limits to see what he can achieve. Um, and he's aware that uh, even incremental progress matters that even if like he he dreams for the hut for the 200 percent improvement and he gets like 25 percent improvement that day he focuses on the 25 percent improvement and that's just something you know no one steve's not paying me to say this <laughs> like this is just something i gleaned from reading the book which has really inspired me um so yeah i i'll, I'll pause there but that's something that really struck me from this book likewise and i i would love Stephen, for you to double click a little bit more about because i think that you do talk a lot about the importance of being aware of your mindset around aging that mindset plays a huge huge role in peak performance aging so can you talk a little bit about your findings in that area yeah i think there's a bunch um so one of the oldest uh findings sort of where I th one of the places in the field of peak performance aging sort of starts is the work with uh of, of dr alan langer who's at Harvard and she, uh, back in the seventies, she's looking at, at questions around priming and language and mindset and aging. And, you know, she's really along with, uh, Dr. Jean Cohen, I think the godparents of the field of peak performance aging. There are a lot of other people who contribute, but, but those two are real heavyweights. Um, and you know, one of Ellen's major points is that aging is not just a physical process. This is much lower of a physical, this is much a mental process as a physical process. And this leads to tons and tons of studies of mindset. And what the, the end result is that we, we know a positive mindset towards aging, which is, um, let me back up and talk, like the mindset of old. Once the voice in your head is Scott just sort of starts doing things like, oh, you're too old for this shit. Mm. That's the mindset of old. And it mm. can set up early in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s. And, um, and we can talk a lot about why and where it comes from because it's it's weird and it doesn't it comes from a good place but it ends up having sort of really negative impacts um later on but uh one of the clearest findings is that a positive in uh, mindset towards aging um the my best days are ahead of me i'm really thrilled about what's what the second half of my life holds will produce an extra seven and a half years of health and longevity and healthy longevity that's like if you're obese and your choices and you got a shitty mindset, your choices, do I lose weight or do I change your mind to my mindset? Mm. Change your mindset, right? If you're a smoker, more important to change your mindset than quits. I mean, like it's literally um, one of, if not the most impactful thing. Now I want to, I want to speak to something else because Scott went right there with what he was talking about. I think personally and I like I knew all this research right I like there's 20 years of research into this book I went into this experiment knowing all the science but still like that long slow rot theory of age you know is really insidious and I think it's really hard to escape um as Scott pointed out one of the things that I, that I found and like you know we, we we've been advocating in our in the peak performance aging trainings that have sort of come out of this NAR style adventures. I'm not saying everybody needs to learn how to park ski. That's what I did, right? Mm -hmm. But by choosing an activity that is supposed to be impossible, Scott, to be basketball, yeah. you know, supposedly impossible for you. It's what it did to me is like, whatever I, limiting beliefs I had about the second half of my life and what was possible. When I started learning 180s and 360s and nose butter 360s and that sort of stuff, um, these things that were supposed to be impossible for me to learn in my 50s that mindset just exploded like it didn't have a chance in the face of, of reality and in a sense this is what i like about this is we you know at frc we often talk about the difference between gratitude and affirmations right and gratitude works really really well and affirmations don't work at all and they tend to backfire um and one of the reasons is the brain's got a built-in bullshit detector. If you're running around going, you know, I am a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, and your brain is looking at you going, buddy, you work at Walmart, shut the fuck up. What are you talking about, right? Yeah. Like, it's totally demotivating. It's sort of the, it, it's sort of the same thing um, uh, in terms of mindset for me, you know, and it, it, so I found it useful to have this style challenge to explode it. And Scott, I, the thing about that, that you pointed out, the last thing I'll say about this in my experience is um, 
that exploded mindset is what allowed me you know progress was really slow and you want it to be slow you want to go to for it to be safe in these kinds of adventures you want to go one inch at a time and, and progress really really slowly and um you were oftentimes like i would have to i would come home and you know i don't know if this is anybody else but like self-expectation has ruined more great days for me than anything there are so many like i'll come to my writing really excited about what i'm going to write or i'll go to the ski area really excited about what i'm going to learn and nothing match it can possibly match my expectations and that used to crush me right i used to come home really like frustrated but now I, I have a different measuring stick and i'm like no no it's one inch at a time so while yeah you didn't do this 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 or this you did move this forward and you did move this forward and you did move this forward and you know those are those are the real wins because it's one inch at a time this is the story of peak performance right one whether it's peak performance or peak performance aging it it's go slow to go fast and it but it and it works like compound interest but it's hard even from the inside right to believe in compound interest and when you know it's going to work, it's hard to believe in it. Dr. Tori, can I um can I illustrate something? Uh, sure. Or just dis discuss the difference between um, the work I, I've done a lot of research on narcissism, and I thought it might be helpful to point out the difference the difference between narcissism and mastery. So um, this mm. book uh, and Stephen's work is uh, sur surrounds mastery, and I and I just wrote down some adjectives that I think define both. So narcissism is fast. Narcissism is immediate uh you're always looking for immediate praise you're always looking for uh immediate confirmation that you're great um mastery is and i just wrote down some adjectives humiliating ego deflating painful meaningful growth oriented authentic pride related mm. hopefully um so the things you get from mastery are more of a mixed bag but ultimately more rewarding and meaningful and it's slower um, the narcissism. Um, a lot of people prefer to take the narcissism route because they're lazy, in my opinion. Uh, but they, the ultimate reward is not as great um, by any stretch of the imagination. You might get some nicer immediate rewards, you know, um, like you fool someone, you know, in, into doing something for you or praising you. But in the long run, um, mastery is where it's at. So anyway, I thought that would be useful to distinguish narcissism from mastery. I think. I think it's incredibly useful. And I think that those are helpful differentiators when thinking about, because I think something that you both said that is really important that I want to highlight for everyone is that one of the ways that we can challenge this mindset of aging and this long, slow rot theory is to have an activity where we can actually practice and explore and grow and, and develop mastery experiences. Right? So, and I think that, you know, at the heart of our country really is a focus on exploration and play yes. later in life, right? And so I want to talk about both of those things, exploration and play. Um, but can you, can, let's talk about exploration first. So can you both weigh in on the importance of exploration and how it relates to growth and peak performance aging? Yes, but I want to circle back on mastery because there's one more thing I want to say about mastery that, that's so important here. Um, mastery and the sense of control that we get in flow are two of the most positive feelings that are available um, to humans. And when we get super positive emotions, mastery and control, top of this list, from a peak performance aging standpoint, that stimulates the production of T cells and natural killer cells. T cells are your immune system, right? They fight disease. Natural killer cells are the cells that target tumors and other sick cells big causes of aging. So there's a mastery is, you know, it's great for exploring this mindset. It's great for lifelong learning. It's got a billion benefits, but like we started talking about the physiological impact of, of mindset, right? And here's another sort of mental physical connection that most, like when they hear mastery, they don't think, oh shit, that's going to boost my immune system in a significant way, but it does. Um, all right. Now from that to exploration, um, I, um, it's the fun, curiosity is the foundational human motivator. It's the first, it's the first most basic sort of human motivator. And it's so powerful. You get a lot of dopamine from exposure to novelty. Um, 
we're hardwired for it. We have a C so here's the here's the real answer I'll give you, Tori. We're got to go back to why do we get this mindset of old? So when we're young, we have it with seven primary emotions in all mammals. When we're young, we lean on what's known as the seeking system. This is our exploratory drives, right? Curiosity. And we lean on the play system, right? And this is how we learn when we're young. And those systems come with certain neurochemicals attached. Mm. Play is predominantly about endorphins. Uh, seeking is really about uh, norepinephrine and dopamine. And these become the drugs that we're addicted to in our youth. And addic that these are strong, I'm using strong uh, language, but these are, these are the pleasure chemicals that we most like and we're most attached to, right? And that we find most rewarding. At what, what the mindset of old happens when you get stuff, you meaning the seeking system has gone away, you get the stuff you want. I've got the right partner, I've got the right job, I've got the right apartment, I've got the right car, I've got the right style, whatever it is. You have stuff that you want to protect, you want to conserve. When we do that, we get serotonin. We also get a little bit of endorphins, but not as much. We mostly get serotonin and oxytocin. These are different drugs. And the mice of old is what happens when the seeking system and the play system shut down. What we know about peak performance aging is you want all seven of these systems active and fully functional. Otherwise, otherwise you have problems. And it's these internal addictions. We get in, addicted to these rewards of safety and security. And they and we do this because humans, it's important for human couples to stay together to raise our children, right? Like that's why it happens. We make this trade because we have, you know, we, we have to be bonded um, from an evolutionary perspective for at least seven years to get our, our, our kids to, you know, it's obviously a lot longer, um, but hunter gatherer era it was seven years that you needed to be together to, to get a kid to be able to take care of himself i don't understand why in the hunter gatherer era when everything could kill you kids got to seven and then they were fine and now they get to like 30 and they're not fine i don't i don't understand but okay subject of another book <laughs> different different, well, totally different, different book, yeah. yeah yeah so i mean I think that this ties in beautifully actually to SBK. You talk in Transcend, you talk about really requiring courage to grow. And Stephen, you're and, and leaving the safety of familiarity in order to grow. And Stephen, you're talking about this elevated drive for security and stability as we grow older. So it seems like there's some tension there that it gets increasingly challenging to explore as we age. How do we reconcile this? What do we do? You just call, I mean, cultivate curiosity, cultivate play. Um, all those things sort of really, really matter and are really, really useful. I mean, like, but again, another reason, like a NARS, this style quest, right? This, this kind of, is it, it rekindles the seeking system. And the, I mean, dopamine is fun, right? Like it's once you started flowing through your system again in a real way. I mean, the other thing that I think you see with a lot of um, adults is they get their only dopamine from their freaking cell phones, right? It's, it just comes in through their technology. It's a really, cheap, not healthy. I mean, the, we can go on and on about cell phones. Cell phones are really, really, really bad for your brain in general, but they're really bad for your brain o over time. They, they actually dampen a lot of things that are already susceptible to a little bit of decline in older adults. And they make a lot of that stuff a lot worse. Um, and it's a terrible way to get sort of dopamine, whereas like exploratory behavior, um, curiosity, different behavior, courageous behavior, stuff Scott was talking about um, and transcend really matters here. Mm. And how do we, what are the recommendations? Because you've referenced it a little bit, but I, I think it would be great to go into a little bit more detail of this, this idea of approaching fear in this more incremental way, this kind of one inch at a time strategy. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it, it grew out of, um, so uh, grew out of two things. Grew out of the need to progress safely, right? Because the one thing that is remains semi-true is that older adults take longer to heal than young people. Now, 
the research around like that is true until stem cells advance to the point that that's no longer true. And we're getting closer and closer with that research It's probably in the next four or five years that that statement is no longer going to actually be true. But right now it remains true. And um, even though regenerative medicine, all our tools for dealing with injury have never been better. And uh, one fact is that we're a lot tougher than we think we are. Like we just are physically, we're a lot physically tougher than we think we are um, on that uh, safety matters. But the other thing is um, it involves a flow thing. So flow states have triggers, right? And the most famous is the challenge skills balance, which says uh, flow follows focus. And we get the most focus when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. Right, you want to stretch but not snap. It's about a five percent gradient difference. Right, that's we find the most flow when the challenge is about four or five percent greater than our skill set. Mm. What we started, what we realized is that we, meaning the flow research collective, the people I was working with on the, on the peak performance aging stuff, was that allostatic load, which is the impact of like trauma over time, physiologically and psychologically, shrinks this challenge skills balance. And especially when you have lots, lots of fear and when you have a lot of fear in your system, when you have too much fear in your system, especially on the physical side, there's a big penalty, right? You can't generate maximum power. You fast twitch muscle response doesn't work as well. You're not as cognitively, you're not as creative. Um, and and there's, so there's a big penalty for fear. And it's really easy. Once you get out of the challenge, because sweet spot, you're moving into anxiety, you're overloaded. So we realized that let's shrink it way, way down. And our motto was one inch at a time or go slow to go fast. Right. And, um, in fact, when, like when we took, we, Ryan Wicks and myself took the, these core ideas and used it to run our experiment in peak performance aging, where we, we took 20 adults and trained them up in this stuff, holding people back was the biggest thing we had to do. We had to call like they, cause the learning happened automatically. So people were like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm making this most progress. I'm learning this really. And it, they like, I, got really excited, lots of dopamine, lots of, lots of fun neurochemistry and calming them down, holding them back was really like, that was a, that we, nobody got hurt, but it was because we kept reminding people like, Hey, like, even if you suddenly feel like Superman, remember that sweet spot is shrunken and you're not going to fix that in a day, right? Like that, that it's got to get fixed slowly over, over a longer period of time. Speaking, speaking of Ryan Wicks, so your training partner in our country, um, mm -hmm. social exploration feels like a key component to growth and peak performance aging. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of social connections, having a training partner, having someone to maybe attempt these activities with? How key is that? For me, it was huge. Um, I, so one, first, first reason is huge um and scott i'm sure can speak to this is that um all those social bonding neurochemicals right are really we need social contact mm. over time um it's really a fundamental component of peak performance aging in fact the only thing that matters almost as much as mindset or as much as mindset is having robust social connections. So what's really important performance over time becomes massively important later in life, but it's really those neurochemicals you're after. And um, the right training partner, you know, to me was really important for that because a lot of the, like, a lot of the things that Ryan and I share is, is it like we have the same pathways into flow. So it was really easy for us to get into group flow, which was really important because I'm an introvert and I'm not like, I'm not the most social person in the world. So I want, I need to get like all the, the social stuff. Like if you go into the blue zones, these long lived communities where some of, some of this social research first started showing up, they'll spend sometimes six hours a day on social connection, working with like family and friends and right. I don't have that kind of time and I don't like people that much. I'm an introvert. I want to be by myself. So if I can get into group flow, right, the shared, I can get all that same neurochemistry in a condensed time frame. So from a time management perspective and to like meet me where I was, because I'm introverted and I don't want all that much social contact. Um, having the right training partner really mattered. I can go on and on and on about that one, but I'll, I'll stop there and let's let me talk for a second. Yeah. Let me clarify something. Uh, but first, I think we should bring Ryan Wicks on stage. What oh, do you think sure. of that idea? 
I could work and, on that. He just, it, I could hear him gulp from here, but yes, I can work on that. <laughs> even just a second, let him wave. And, and so just to put a face to, uh, you know, we're talking about him. So um, yeah, it might be good to bring him up here. Um, there's something I would like to clarify, though, because um, there's a lot of misconceptions about introversion. Uh, and one of the misconceptions is that somehow you don't like people. Um, and I think that's a misconception of introvers. And, um, and I think it's it's helpful actually to distinguish between social connection, the need for social connection and the need for social exploration. In my book, Transcend, I actually uh, clearly distinguish between the two needs and argue there are two separate needs that, um, uh, that both have to be satisfied to a certain degree to feel like you're whole in some way. Um, the thing with introverts is that they're less, by their default, they're less into novel. So, so social exploration, it, it kind of scares them. <laughs> it's, it's not their thing uh, um, as much as extroverts, but they are just as interested in deep social connection as extroverts. Um, there's no, there's no statistically significant difference. Yeah, no, there. I mean, I misspoke. I'm a misanthropic. No, you personally are. I know, I you, personally I know, don't I like know. people. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I personally, personally don't. You know, this but is I wanted to just clarify. Thing. It's just me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's just Stephen. Actually, is yeah, just a confluence of these personality traits. But um, but I, I do distinguish between the need for social exploration versus the need for high quality connections. Um, and I think as we age, it becomes more and more important for more social exploration, because I think that. When you do that, you start to realize life ain't over yet. <laughs> like we can get in this rut as we get older that like, oh my gosh, like, is it, is it over? Or are my best days behind me? <laughs> you know, like those kinds of questions we ask ourselves. But I think do of the big role of dopamine uh, as we age is giving us hope. And I actually think if we force ourselves to get out of our bubbles and talk to lots of different people and things, actually that broadens our mind to think that maybe there are, it stimulates new possibilities for us. And then just so keep Scott, one thing that's friends. weird on this one. Yeah. One thing that's weird yeah, yeah. is um, I was talking to Paul Zach about this, who's sort of mm. the oxytocin guru. My question was if you're a nature, so we know, by the way, like you can get the same neurochemistry from petting a dog as from spending time with humans, right? Like, yeah. so we know that. And there's study after study that. But Paul Zach and I was like, you know, if you're a nature lover, I, jo I, I say throughout the book, um, in our country that some of my best friends are trees. I love being in forests. I love being in nature. And I really do feel that. And so our question was, if you're really, really nature philic, can you get those same neurochemicals, those social bonding neurochemicals from time in nature? If you think that you, if you have that deep connection with nature, um, our argument was yes, but it had that nobody that we know of has measured it. So we don't, we don't like, I haven't seen data, but we're, the thinking was yes. Well, there is, there is research showing that spending time in nature does increase serotonin. Um, yeah, there's seen there, the serotonin, but that is isn't that about, um, that's about fractal landscapes and being able to predict what happens next and, and the, the calms the brain down. Um, but that's that anything that activates the calm and connect system in my my eyes is thumbs thumbs up right totally <laughs> i don't care agree. where it's i don't care where totally it's coming agree. from all uh, right yeah. you brought ryan, ryan on this ryan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah yes, BK, thanks for, are thanks you for are you mad me at me for doing this ryan or are you happy i did this uh no i'm i'm happy you did it yeah blushing a little bit when you called out my name first it started with tori and then uh and then you followed but no i'm glad to be here I wanted to this meet is you. exciting yeah, this is exciting. This is one of Steven's human friends, since most of his friends apparently are trees and dogs. So Ryan is among the well, small we group of people. Two. Scott's, Scott's <laughs> longtime friend. Um, that's true. So we got true. Just, it's two. That's perfect. True. An N of two. I so I actually think that Ryan being here is a perfect segue to what you were just talking about, Scott, mm -hmm. about social exploration mm -hmm. later in life. And Steven, you talk about this theme of actually looking for and acquiring replacement friends. And for those of you who can't see us right now, who are just listening, Ryan and Steven are not the same age, right? Yeah, this is, uh, this, I mean, this shows up, man, it's in everybody's work. Um, it, it really is. Anybody who's, who's sort of worked on, on aging, um, we tend to make friends in our generation and meaning everybody tends to die together. And if you're doing peak performance aging work, and you're going to outlive a lot of people if you don't make what they literally they don't like this term anymore but they used to call replacement friends um it gets remarkably lonely and I, you know i tell this story i have a dear friend 
who was one of the brightest minds of the 20th century, really genius. He's now very, very old. Every single one of his friends are dead. And he was, Scott will relate to this or get, get what I'm talking oh, about, but there's a certain kind of like thinker in the 1970s. There was a kind of systems thinking, cybernetic systems thinking that it doesn't exist anymore. And, but it was, it was very particular to this, his like a generation of thinkers that this man was part of. Mm. And he, at one point, like during COVID, I think his last living friend had died. He's like, he was talking to him. He's like, well, first of all, he was like really happy that I called because he's like, I don't, nobody else calls me. I don't have any other friends. And he said, one of the things he said to me, he's like, there's nobody left on the planet who thinks like me. Mm. And I was like, it's sort of like, it was one of those like stunningly weird moments where I was like, oh, wow, that's actually like I heavy. That's wild. Um, yeah. And uh, so replacement friends really matter. And the other, the flip side of this, the inverse is that those cultures uh, where people are exceptionally long lived, right? The so-called blue zone, but really any, any, any culture where people live a very long, healthy time. One of the things that underpins those societies are cross, uh, cross generational friendships, hmm. like young people, friends with old people, old people, friends with young people really, really, really matters for kind of healthy functioning societies and healthy aging. Yeah, that's really mm -hmm. Stephen. And I think it's one of the reasons why I've always been attracted to action sports. Mm. Right. Because they happen in these environments where mm. all different ages of athletes are contributing mm. right to the over kind of the overall feel of that day, whether it be in a train park on the mountain, in a skate park, in a surf break, you know, at your local crag. I think action sports just very naturally, you know, the cultures that have evolved with those those specific activities are very inclusive of all ages. And it just seems that, you know, regardless of your skill set, everyone kind of has the opportunity to contribute to something, you know, aesthetically with their attitude, um, you know, with their creativity, how they're interpreting the terrain or. Love um, yeah. I love it. Ryan, can I tell you about a finding we just uh, we just found uh, that uh, we're, we have, we're, we're, we're submitting the paper. It's been accepted. So it'll be out. It'll be out. So I'm telling you find a finding that we just found that, that isn't published yet, but it'll be out soon. So to our surprise, we looked at the six dimensions of curiosity in trying to in trying to predict creative achievement in life. And we looked mm. across many domains, including sports. Um, and we found that out of all the dimensions of so there's a lot of dimensions of curiosity. There's like um, there's deprivation uh, reduction, you know, you're, you're driven to reduce deprivations. There's joyous exploration. Actually, I predicted joyous exploration would be the biggest predictor. Um, there's stress tolerance, et cetera. We found, to our surprise, the biggest one was thrill seeking. And we did not expect that. No one's ever found that in the literature. That, And when we looked at the items, it's not the kind of thrill seeking that's like, that's like psychopath thrill seeking. <laughs> it's, well, if you look at the items, the items actually have a lot to do with mastery, getting a thrill for mastery. So when you actually look at the items on the thrill-seeking curiosity questionnaire that Todd Cashton, he's a co-author on this paper, developed, um, the kind of items are things like I, I'm really attracted to um, to the unknown. I'm really attracted to um, uh, to overcoming something that uh, is a little scary. And so anyway, you just make me think of that when you talked about your attraction to advent to adventure sports and things like that. I, 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 I think you probably would score high in this facet. What do you think, Ryan? I think I would. I look forward to taking it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you the test. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Send me the scale. Sure. 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 And I think you're both really pointing out some kind of key factors for people to be thinking about, because I'm hoping that as people were listening to all of you, that they're starting to think about what activities in their life could they start adopting to explore to grow to develop mastery experience so i think these factors are really helpful to start identifying those i think it'd be also helpful to think about what are some of the key components to finding a helpful training partner to embark on these types of activities with because steven i know you talk a lot about why ryan was a great training partner for you what are some of the factors that people should be kind of weighing out to help identify these partners to me the, the it was I guess three things mat mattered the most. Um, 
you can't ignore that like psychological safety, safety in general, like Ryan and I have a long history of skiing together and oftentimes, so I'm prone to vertigo, uh, due to like inner ear stuff and the world will start spinning. And oftentimes, like I'll be in really gnarly situations and the world will be spinning and my like muscle control is gone. Everything's gone. And I'm so bullheaded. I'm focused on like, how do I ski this thing? And Ryan, I'll be like, buddy, buddy, let's just come back later. Like, come not now. Let's let like, cause he can see what my app, like long before I do. So like one thing is, you know, the right training partner uh, keeps you safe, helps you stay safe, even in the face of yourself. The, but the two things that matter, I think the most with Ryan and I, not me, one, we have, uh, we have the same, um, learning preferences, learning styles. And I'm not talk about the wildly disproved idea of like visual kinesthetic or auditory right. learners. Right. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, uh, what I'm talking about is like Ryan and I are both a little introverted. We like learning in private. We don't want to be ski under the chairlift very often. We want to like go off where nobody can see us. We like the same terrain styles we like the same kind of adventure um we're in roughly the same shape physically so we can do similar like all of that is very very similar um also we have the same warm-ups like path into flow and this is really different with action sport athletes i know a ton of athletes who want to as soon as they get to the mountain they want to go to the hardest terrain they can find and that's where they want to start that is not like i I have a very slow, like four or five run warm up um, that we both use, and it works really well for both of us. And it doesn't, we don't take risks, physical risks, until we're already sort of in flow. Um, that, that's never sort of what we're using to get into flow. So I found that like path into flow really matters learning style really matters psychological safety really matters there's probably a ton more but to me i think those were the, the big three yeah if i could add one fun one to that Stephen, is that you know very early on i think what what i found in Stephen was just in pattern recognition right the aesthetic of what we were looking to achieve on snow you know what we were looking to emulate on snow was very similar and yeah so there was an overlap in goals too right actually. no doubt right yeah yeah no even doubt. stylistically like both of our approach to park skiing is not it's weird it's off kilter from the from the normal uh from what normally people try to achieve in terrain parks and much more creatively based but uh, it's more about the creative interpretation of terrain features rather than like how many spins or flips can you throw? Mm -hmm. I think these are super helpful. I think tangible takeaways for people to start trying to maybe identify some of these people in their life that might be good uh, NarQuest training partners. Um, I want to, Scott, you got to briefly touch, you said the word creativity. I want to go there. Um, mm -hmm. This is a huge feature of NAR country as well. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I'm actually going to read uh, a quote from NAR country here. Um, Stephen, you write that as we get older, quote, there are fundamental shifts in how the brain processes information. In simple terms, our ego starts to quiet and our perspective starts to widen. Whole new levels of intelligence, creativity, empathy, and wisdom open up. As a result, key downstream skills like critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, communication, cooperation, and collaboration all have the potential, if properly cultivated, to skyrocket in yeah. our later years. So, Steven, I would love for you to talk about these superpowers, particularly how creativity changes across the lifespan and what factors might influence some of these changes in just a second. But for those of you that just leaned in, hearing that you can essentially get superpowers as you age, reminder, go to the call to action button, get your hands on the how-to guide for peak performance aging and just a massive suite of tools to ensure that you know how to apply this cutting age science into your own life to cultivate and access the superpowers that we're about to explore. Buy three books, gain thousands of dollars worth of these peak performance tools. Yep. Don't sleep on this. All right, Dr. I'll let you Terry. choose. Yeah. Um, so Claire, Claire, Claire Goodridge, my colleague, is in is in this um, uh, chat room. Hi, Claire. 
and we all love Claire. She's a good friend here. Um, and uh, she's really good at finding articles really quickly. <laughs> so I'm hoping she can find a link to put in there, uh, um, a, a free uh, resource that from my webpage that we I published an article with Martin Seligman. Yeah, um, I was just, okay, so this is the greatest creativity. article in the universe. Find <laughs> yeah. this article, Claire, this well, we, is so good. We put good. together all yeah, yeah. the research we're talking about. It's called Creativity and Aging, What Do We Still Have Left When We're Old or whatever. Um, and it really goes through systematically and looks at every kind of facet. Um, and and it dovetails so nicely with all the things you just mentioned. That was our conclusion as well. All those, yeah, all also, those by the way, I've read, the read everything there is to read about creativity and aging. Yeah, I think yeah. this is the best article, my oh, favorite article. Yeah, yeah. So find, let's find this article. I Claire, Claire, Paul, we're, 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 we're all rooting for you. To find we're all rooting for you, Claire. <laughs> um, you can, it's on I've got it read. somewhere on my computer, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> Look like like Google Kaufman. So, did she follow it? Oh, Casey Maxwell found it. Casey. There you go. Hi, Casey. Um, Thank you, Casey. Uh, and also Marie Forgiard uh, was a co-author on that as well. I want to give her credit. Yeah. Um, she did her whole dissertation under Martin Seligman on creativity. Um, but anyway, I, I, what is so striking is, is the confluence of these findings um, that there, yes, we do tend to see that fluid reasoning skills um, do show a, a bit of a, a decrement as we get older, but those fluid reasoning skills really don't matter when you're in the flow state. And I think this is the point that <laughs> Stephen's making here is that if we can arrange our lives to be more um, in, a, in a kind of state of flow that's drawing on our crystallized intelligence and drawing on our like our, our large, our wisdom, our large storehouse of knowledge, um, all the th experiences we've built up in our lives, our episodic memory doesn't disappear as we get older. Uh, it gets a little bit harder to access it as when we get dementia. That that's true. But um, barring barring dementia, um, you know, being able to get a flow state that accesses all those goodies and doesn't tap into the fluid reasoning system, you can kind of side 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 sweat side step aging to a to a very large extent. Well, th yeah. and the other th the other thing that's really interesting. So one of the things. Um, they do this really cool thing in the article where there's a table. It's maybe my favorite favorite table in any in anything I've seen on aging, where you list the like sort of this is these are all the skills that go into creativity. These are the ones that decline over time, and these are the ones we gain over time, right? And the list of things that decline is really ultimately short. It's like eight items long, if I if I'm correct. And the list of what we gain is is a lot longer. But one of the things that um, uh, is on the list of, of declines, I believe, was task switching, and yes. right ability. And so here's something interesting. Um, and the, it, it was Dr. Adam Gasali, who's at UCSF, who we do a lot of work with at the Flow Research Collective, hit the cover of Nature a bunch of years ago because he figured he created a video game. It's now uh, it's the only vi it's been approved by the FDA for the treatment of cognitive decline in older adults. It's the only video game that's ever been approved as a medicine. And it's like 20 minutes a day, three times a week. And what it actually focuses on is test switching, this very thing, which does decline over time, but it turns out he found a way to train it. It's tricky to train. So even some of the stuff that like, we know it declines over time, mm. you can still train some of that stuff up. Here's something even wilder on the fluid intelligence tip that, that Ryan and I were, uh, we were actually meeting with some experts on this week. So, Fluid intelligence, one of the reasons it goes away is because processing speed slows down because myelination, right? White matter, yes. insulation in the brain's wires declines over time. We, there's starting to be some proof, and we, we think this may be true. So what people don't often realize is that uh, bone health and bone density is directly tied to brain stuff over time because the bones are your nutrient and mineral storehouse. It's where the body stores and if you think about it, brains run, among other things, on calcium, right? There's nothing in the brain that happens without calcium. Where do you think it yeah. comes from? Bones, uh, bone minerals, and, and some of the only stuff that crosses the blood-brain border. So the, there's now new proof or new evidence or pointing in that direction that if we can increase bone density over time, then we, there are a lot of ways to do this now. Some of the processing speed, some of the stuff that we think declines over time, that might actually be a bone problem, not a brain problem. And we figured out how to improve bone density over time. That's that's really trainable at this point. So even some of the stuff that, that we think declines over time, we're starting to find ways around it. But Scott's really right. His point is you can sort of bypass a lot of the, the things that decline over time. Uh, with sort of a flow mastery based protocol. And if you want to fight off Alzheimer's and dementia, 
we know that the two best ways to do it is lifelong learning and you need expertise and wisdom, right? Mastery and wisdom are the two best ways to build up cognitive reserve, which is what protects against Alzheimer's dementia and cognitive decline. Um, yeah. I mean, I love everything you just said, Stephen, and it just makes me think of the the old debate on intelligence versus expertise. Um, I remember when I was really young, uh, there were a lot of things the gifted kids could do that uh, quickly at first that um, took me a little bit longer to do. Like, um, I remember we all had we all played uh, Tetris <laughs> at lunch together, and I'm like, oh, the gifted kids always beat me. But I, you know, the more expertise you gain the more intelligent you start to look, and I don't think it's fooling anyone. I think it's real intelligence. It's just a different kind of intelligence. But I always found that through my own deliberate hard work to learn things and to build up automatic skills, automaticity, um, I, I could get to a point where I started to overtake the gifted kids. Mm -hmm. and, and it just raises lots of deep, profound questions in my view about what is giftedness then? What is the real nature of giftedness? Is there only one way to be gifted? Um, do you, do you, the processing speed issue, is that the only way, you know, do you have to have high processing speed to be a gifted human or can you really- um, Well, that's, I mean, the, Scott, the so I would say grid. this, like, yeah. and, and, and I, like, I'm a, in the room, like if you're puzzle solving in the room, mm -hmm. I'm probably not the guy you want in the room. Right. But if I can sleep on it, if you want to give on. me the problem, let yep. me go home and me sleep too. on it and wake up in the morning, I'm the guy you want in the room, right? And I, and, and you are too. So like similar, yeah. that, like, so some of the stuff on processing speed is really weird because if you're looking at like solutions people need to come to, to sleep on it versus like people who have really right. fast minds, like right. you're often gonna take the, the solutions from the folks who need to sleep on it. I don't like, we're measuring it's a weird thing. There are certain situations where that's an amazing, amazing ability, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's much more limited, I think, than, you know, well, I don't have to tell you this. You did battle against, this is, this is the first 30 year career. This was, this was your cross to bear. This, this is exactly why I'm resonating so much with this conversation and with your book and this conversation is I think that we undervalue wisdom so much in our schools. Um, and we overvalue quick thinking as opposed to deep or reflective thinking. Mm -hmm. This is the, yeah, you're absolutely right. 20, I'd say 25 years scientifically been trying to rail against that outdated model of learning and potential. Um, so really resonate with the book because it, it just gets to the heart of this with the aging thing as well. You know, it's very easy to just say as we age, we get less intelligent. But if we include things like expertise and and deep skills and mastery into the picture, I think the picture looks different as you show, Stephen. So that's why it's a really profound conversation. <laughs> if I say so myself. <laughs> I, I, Corey, really quick, I wanted to ask Stephen just on that tip of wisdom. Um, Stephen, it's not just a quality, right? It, it, wisdom has a neurobiological. No, system. it's um. So uh, the if, if uh, whoever's uh whoever's doing our research for us, look up Dilip Jest, who's at UCSD, mm -hmm. and some of his work on on wisdom. I like I like his work sort of the best, but wisdom is a is a very clear, definable neurobiological trait. In fact, since this is an FRC thing. You know, Chick Set Me High did a ton of work on wisdom. And uh, let me pull up, I've got it. I'm gonna find a quote for you. It's gonna take me a second to do this. So, but Chick Set Me High has one of these, these, the most amazing quotes on wisdom. And he points out, and I always, he, he's like, look, if you're gonna assess wisdom, you gotta make sure that the people enjoy their life. Like if they're not enjoying their life, if you don't, like if you don't look at them and go, Oh my God, they're having a blast. He's like, there's no way you can call them wise. They're not like, if that's not wise, if there's not, if it isn't a high quality life that like, you know, he's, he's, he points out, I'll find the quote in a second, but he points out that there's a foundation. Joy is a fundamental component of wisdom and it's gotta be, it shows up in the living and the approach. And I think that's so, 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 so key. Um, hmm. As a point, though, okay, so you guys talk amongst yourself and give me a second to find this quote. I think a big part of wisdom 
By the way, let me let me just distinguish intelligence from creativity first of all. Or create or, or, or into okay, I'll I'm gonna give you a bunch of definite quick definitions. Intelligence is the capacity and ability to discern what is. Imagination is the ability, capacity to discern what could be. Creativity requires both intelligence and imagination. And then what is wisdom? Okay, that's next level shit right there. Wisdom is the integration of all of that. Um, in a way, actually, that allows us to transcend the ordinary dichotomies we see in our society. So actually, I see wisdom as a way of uh, being able to have what Ma Abraham Maslow called dichotomy transcendence. And, and this relates a lot to Stephen's uh, mindset of, you know, screw it, I'm not going to take the standard sort of way of conventional way of limits of thinking. I'm not going to think either or about it. I'm going to think yes and. I think yes and thinking is wisdom, uh, very much so. You know, being able to say it's not you're either 40 or you're 60. You know, you're either either have 40 year old abilities or 60 year old abilities. You're either um, good versus evil. I mean, you you can transcend and come up. You know, it's not like everything is either one or the other. You know, um, wisdom to me is being able to have that kind of dichotomy transcendence. I don't know if that's a couple helpful. things on wisdom. Also, one of the things that I always talk about, and this is this is not a definition. This is just a practical way to think about sort of how it splits up. And this is not a hundred percent, but it's generally accurate. Expertise is what we learn consciously. Wisdom is what we learn non-consciously, right? So you go into the lecture and the lecture is on dealing cards. So you're learning that consciously, how to deal cards, but you're also learning what's the power dynamic in the room and mm -hmm. who's sitting, like all that's non-conscious. Okay, this is, um, and by the way, this is Chick Set Me High and Chick Set Me High. So it's it's me, I Chick Set Me High and his wife, Isabella Chick Set Me High, in an essay they wrote together um, on wisdom. It is essential to remember that the pursuit of wisdom and its deployment thrive on joy. The best recipe mm -hmm. for the spread of wisdom is the deployment of curiosity, respect for the best accomplishments of the past, coupled with the burning desire to improve on them, and all of this within a conception of self that extends to other people, the planet, and beyond. When these elements are in place, a joyful immersion in the complexity of life is likely to ensure an openness to experience, a willingness to delve deep into issues of concern to self and others. If such an attitude develops far enough, then understanding life becomes increasingly rewarding in itself. The person will be seen as wise, and his or her actions will also be considered wise. Um, and what, what it, I like about that is what they're saying is the development of wisdom itself is a form of mastery and it's its own reward. Wisdom, like mastery, becomes its own reward. And you without if wisdom isn't its own reward, you don't get the title of wise. And I think that's really, that's sort of cool. Um, I like that. I, I, I like how they, they thought about that a lot. That is so interesting. So do you think that um, there can be no conscious forms of wisdom? Is that no, I thinking? do think there are a lot of conscious forms of wisdom, but I think that like, if you look at the, even if you look at the neurobiological systems that are involved in sort of wisdom, it's a lot of it is stuff that shows up more in like non-conscious learning. Passive than knowledge. Learning. Pardon Passive, me? Yeah. The, 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 the phrase of that is in the field is called tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that is so interesting. You know, you know, I did my dissertation on implicit learning and how that was unrelated to IQ type intelligence, that unconscious intelligence was a thing that should have been that should be more studied in the field. That'd be super interesting to see how that relates to explicit wisdom. Um, anyway, that's just the nerd that's in me. That's just the nerd in me wondering what the what the no, 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 it, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, no, it's interesting. Um, and it, uh, I think also, uh, you know, it's harder to verbalize the stuff we learn non-consciously often, right? Yeah. Um, also, which is interesting because it makes me wonder, uh, is wisdom more of an embodied, is it, is it distribute, is it, is it distributed, right? There's a lot of work on wisdom in the brain, but um, if it's very non-conscious, it's also probably very embodied and like, what is the embodied like what is the embodied side of wisdom is another geeky weird ass question mm -hmm. that brings and then, and then and out of our body you know how do other minds influence you know the extended mind hypothesis so that's if you want to open up another can of worms you know how do how do the minds of others influence our embodied cognition 
is subtly in, in ways we're not aware of, you know, non-consciously. Like our conversation right now, you're influencing me in lots of ways I'm not fully able to articulate, you know, and then I could say something that sounds wise and then not give credit to the fact that it was really the emergent interaction between all four of these minds in the room today. You know, you know what? That's what narcissists do, by the way. Narcissists are really good at, at <laughs> whatever thought ends their, enters their head. They're like, that's brilliant. <laughs> and, and ignoring the fact that it takes so much. They've read so much. They've learned so much from others. You know, it's like, you know what I mean, Stephen? No, I, 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 I like that. I like, I, I like the idea of, even when you say something brilliant in a conversation, recognizing that it's an emergent property of the folks exactly. you're talking to. I never, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's really smart and, you know, humble in a way that I, that I, that I like, and, and I probably much more scientifically accurate as well. Yeah. I mean, like when we, when we get riffing, Stephen, you know, we even do this for text messaging sometimes when we get riffing, I don't think it's easy to discern which one of us independently of the other is, is is more had a more brilliant text. You no, know, it's we're we're in the flow. That the me is where flow comes in, my my man. You know, if you can get group flow, well, it's also flow, like I know like, you know all this kind of stuff, jazz. I notice this all the time. We we were talking about good partners. Like one of the reasons Ryan and I um work so well together. One of the reasons Scott and I are such good friends. Mm. We laugh a lot together. And yeah. one of the things that I always pay attention to is um laughing a lot together even so like for the guy who's telling the joke or the for the person telling the joke sorry guy by the way sorry it's a gender neutral term when i use it um i i don't, I don't mean it in a, in a in a masculine way i really it's just neutral to me but um i noticed that like the ability to laugh easily makes funny people funnier right so if you're if funny people are not around people who laugh easily they're less funny Right, like the laugh, there something about the comedic mind is dependent upon the laughter of others. Even though you like laughter looks so much like the reaction to the funny, but it's also stimulating the fun. Like it's it's a circular thing, and one is not possible with the other. Even in something where you totally give credit to the person being funny, and you never actually give credit to the person laughing. But the truth of the matter is, like you can't do it without it. Try to be funny around people who aren't laughing. You can keep cracking those jokes. Like it doesn't work. The brain stops being doing what it does that makes you funny. Yeah. It's an anterior thing, that cortex thing, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> we promised people it was going to get nerdy and we're going to take a deep dive. So here we are. Um, so this something audience talked about, loves it. This audience it's, loves it. No doubt. I love it. I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, something we haven't talked about that I promised we'd circle back to that really is a vehicle for a lot of what we were just talking about, creativity, unconscious learning, the experience of joy is play. And play is a huge theme in our country. So can we talk a little bit? We haven't talked about dynamic, deliberate play. What is it? Let's talk about it. Why, why is it important? So um, dynamic, deliberate play is usually important for peak performance aging. Let's just define the term dynamic is a fancy way of saying, so we talked about use it or lose it skills earlier, right? On the physical side, if you want to sort of hold on to physical functionality, there's five things to train. Stamina, strength, balance, agility, and flexibility. When somebody uses the word dynamic, it is literally shorthand for all five of those functional fitness skills, right? That's just, it's a simple way of saying all five of those things are present. And deliberate play is you've all heard about deliberate practice. It's Anders Ericsson's brilliant research into expertise. And um, it turns out deliberate practice is great. It's repet deliberate practice is repetition with incremental advancement. And it's great for learning very specific kinds of skills, but in general, deliberate play, which is outperforms deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. Deliberate play is repetition without repetition or repetition with improvisation. You do what you just did, but you improv a little bit on top of it and it's playful. What's the big deal? Well, one, deliberate practice, I always say this, with deliberate practice, there's only one right answer. You do this thing you used to do and you get it a little bit better and that everything else is wrong. So there's 365 degrees, 364 degrees are wrong. There's one degree of right. With deliberate play, 
repetition without repetition. There's only one thing where you could be wrong, which is you do the same thing you just did. Everything else is a right answer. There's no shame. There's no self-consciousness. There's no embarrassment. So first of all, older adults, one of the things we know, there's this rumor that there's a motor skills learning window that slams shut after childhood. And like a lot of things around aging, yes and no. There is a motor learning window and it does start, it does close, but only in very particular ways. What really changes is how we learn. Kids learn through playing. Adults stop learning through playing. They learn through grinding, basically. And grinding produces a lot less neurochemistry. When we play, play is directly tied to our endorphin system. The periaqual gray, which produces most of the endorphins in the brain, gets really activated by play. Endorphins are really powerful drugs. Not only do they feel good, they usually amplify learning, right? So um, if you get this, you learn faster with deliberate play. A lot of the negative stuff sort of gets out of the way. There's a lot more space to be right in a deliberate play environment. That motor learning window opens back up and um, and it's just fucking fun, right? And it, like, it's just fun. And by the way, positive emotions, lower stress, increase the production of T cells and natural killer cells. So like, really, really good anti-aging medicine as well. I'll stop there. No, Stephen, look, did you coin that deliberate play? Because that's brilliant. <laughs> did no, you it's that? Scott, it actually shows up in the literature back in, um, it's old. It's like 1979, I think, is the first, uh, first sighting in the literature that I've found. It wow. sort of went out of fashion for a while. It shows up again recently uh, more in the embodied cognitive literature of embodied cognition now than than kind of a lot of other places. But it's actually a fairly old idea. And it actually made me wonder. It's too bad that Anders um, yes. passed away because I would ask him. It made me wonder if he got the idea for deliberate practice from this deliberate play idea. I doubt it, it. I doubt it, too. But it like it's it's been in the literature for a while, actually. So well, it's brilliant. I think we need to bring it back like in a more mainstream way, 100%. Um, I love it. One of my biggest um, ongoing um, uh, friendly um, tensions with Anders Ericsson um, was this idea that deliberate practice fully explains and accounts for creative thinking and creative behavior. And I tried to make the point that um, most of the work he did on, on deliberate practice only applies to well-structured domains where consistent, totally. not ill-structured yeah. domains, which is a lot of what you focus on in the book. Um, I wrote an article. If, if someone can Google this and put the link in uh, for Scientific American, it's called Creativity is Much More Than 10,000 Hours of Deliberate Practice. I think and that really pissed Anders off. I mean, me and him were friends, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, but there was this always... Yeah, no, I tension I, uh, yeah. so funny i have to tell you a funny anders erickson story hmm. i may rest in this. peace yeah i'm yeah may rest in peace i met him at the santa fe institute hmm. and if you read the rise of superman you know there like there's three or uh, art of impossible there's three big challenges to anders erickson's work his the first was mounted by him in reaction to malcolm gladwell's work where he was like look it's not across the board it's only in certain really structured environments uh david epstein in the brilliant book range hmm mounts a challenge. And then all the flow research says, wait a minute, you can get to mastery using flow a lot faster than, 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 than as long as deliberate practice takes. Right. Um, and I'm in the bathroom at the Santa Fe Institute, this conference on big performance that he's at, I'm mm. in a stall. And I suddenly I hear this voice that says, I hear you got a problem with my research. And there's oh, literally nobody else in the bathroom. Oh, and I was no. like, wait a minute, what's going, what the hell is going on? And I was like, is that literally Anders Ericsson? And I sort of like poked my head out of the stall and he was laughing. And I was like, oh, you're messing with me. I get it. That is so <laughs> funny. freaking funny. It was he funny. Is, he is very funny. Um, uh, David, if someone can find my recent chat with David Epstein on uh, greatness on my podcast, we, oh. we, in a respectful way, we both really dive deep into this topic. And so for people who want to actually go even deeper, there are a lot of nuances around it. But he was really, um, really convinced that uh, Dillard Practice explained everything about learning, learning acquisition, you know, and uh, and it just depends. And it, it just it depends on the field in a lot of ways. I couldn't imagine Stephen making the kind of progress you did without deliberate play. Couldn't imagine. Oh, I don't think it's possible. No. Because with the thing with deliberate practice is 
like especially tr trying to learn something like like park skiing where like when you make an error when you don't get it right often it comes with consequences right like he was working on like violinists and concert musicians and uh mathematicians where like you get something wrong and it sounds bad or there's an error in your math but when i fuck up park skiing i fall down and it hurts so like yeah. if repetition you know with incremental advancement is the only way forward then i have to like you can't do it with stuff where there's there's physical where, where, where wrong means it could hurt it doesn't work that way you have to like i often find that, that ryan and i have this joke the easiest way not to learn a skill on a given day while skiing is to claim you're going to learn that skill at the front end of the day you will learn a million other things you'll learn 17 other things but the thing you came to learn it doesn't work because there's too much expectation there's too much pressure i'm amazed when it comes to deliberate practice that he actually even got the results he got because mm. like the the people personality types that fit that deliberate practice model it's such a narrow bandwidth of people it's amazing to me that he got those results i always wonder about like where did you recruit your subjects well how did you f right like those I are mean, the questions i started asking. I, I, and <laughs> the, an the answers are you know he used very tightly controlled experimental procedures which he thought was the only way to study this. And, you know, the lineages, both of us studied with um, Herb Simon. Um, I was Herb Simon's last research assistant before he passed away. And he and Andrew, I did not know that. You worked well, with a lot of giants, but I've Herb been blessed to have great mentors in my career. 100% I've been blessed. Um, but yeah, Carnegie Mellon, um, and it, that's where Anders Ericsson ran these original studies where it was at Carnegie Mellon two, three decades before I arrived at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but very, very tightly controlled situations where you take all the uh, noise but out of it. But in real life, the noise is where the creativity is. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you're kind of like controlling for creativity. I, you know, I never quite put it that way, but yeah. So play, obviously, a huge reason why you made so much progress. Another piece you just touched on that I'd love to double click there, Stephen, is embodied cognition. Right? That played a major role in why you were able to be so successful. Can you talk about that? Well, um, God, we could go on for, okay, so one, Shameless SBK plug. If you're if you're unfamiliar with in body cognition, you're looking for a, a way in. Annie Paul Murphy's The Extended Mind is probably the best book, but SBK's interview with Annie Paul Murphy is the mm. best interview she's given um, on that book. That I, that, I love and her. I, and I, she's really smart. Love His her. interview with her is particularly great. In body cognition, is just simple. A simple idea: we're not heads on sticks. The brain is fully embedded in our body. To take it one step further, the body is fully embedded in the environment. And as we were talking about this with laughter a minute ago, like it's a combination of all these things, but like where embodied cognition mattered to us was, was a couple of things. We, uh, there was a learning protocol that we, we utilized to teach people how to park ski. Let me just sort of walk you through it because this is the best way to answer this question. So our learning protocol was based on this one inch at a time thing. And I wasn't trying to teach anybody tricks. Tricks are too difficult. Well, we were, we took park skiing and snowboarding, we broke into eight foundational movements. There's more movements, like there's a couple others, but it's basically eight movements, a crouch, a jump, a slash, a grind, a 360, a 180 and skiing switch or backwards or riding backwards, right? Those are the foundational motions. We would do two a day. And our idea was we're going to introduce new movement patterns, which um, allow you to creatively interpret the terrain features. Anybody who studies flow knows that creativity is a flow trigger. And so we given people tools that like allowed them creatively interpret and safely interpret terrain features, right? Go one inch at a time. Don't do anything you can't do. Just build playfully on what you can do. And that's creative actions will drop you into flow flow massively amplifies learning that's what took care of learning teaching people tricks right how did we do instruction so one in body cognition says that anything you learn while moving you'll learn faster so you want to learn a foreign language add a wild gesture to each word you'll learn it much faster it's um because we're embodied systems um in fact one of my favorite findings ever out of embodied cognition is with infants 
if you pair when an infant points at something, if a mother then names it, the combination of the mother naming it and the infant pointing, the infant will adopt the word into their vocabulary within two months. But if it doesn't happen, they, they may not learn it at all. Um, and so there's this whole thing now about gesture poverty. It turns out low income communities, they tend to gesture less than in more affluent communities and gesturing is primordial language. We learn, we, we think first in gesture and then it becomes words. And if you limit gestures in infants, they don't, their minds don't become as complex. So there's now all these programs where they go into low income communities and they literally just teach parents how to gesture more because it expands the intelligence of, of the children. These are all embodied cognitive findings. One of the things that we did is we just sort of update, we took all this and updated old ideas that are around in the inner game of tennis, the inner game of skiing, um, about learning and mirror neurons. And Ryan and I would play follow the leader games around the mountains. So he would do something and I would try to do what he did. And if I, if it was too advanced for me, I would just dial it back and do, you know, a lesser version of, of that same move right in a playful manner or, or vice versa and when we brought other people into this adventure we did these follow the leader style learning simply put when you watch when you're doing that when you watch somebody perform a skill your brain run your mirror neurons will run the exact same physical program and most people don't know this you literally get a signal a kin an interoceptive signal of whether or not you have that movement You'll get a little bit of dopamine if your body can perform the movement and you'll get a little bit of norepinephrine fear if you can't. And this happens every time we watch people perform. So we just took that, this embodied mirror neuronal system, right? We're great apes. Humans are great apes. We learn through imitation. This is the system that's underneath it. And we just used it as our primary learning tool. We kept a lot of the verbal instruction out of it. Um, because that just clouds up the prefrontal cortex, keeps you out of flow, keeps you thinking, keeps you conscious, does a whole bunch of stuff that blocks learning and blocks oh. flow. And we let the flow state sort of, and the and our embodied cognitive skills sort of take handle the learning for us. I'm imagining an fMRI machine scanning the brain and showing like a cloud vaporized over the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> like you said clouds the prefrontal. I'm imagining what that would look, how that would look on an fMRI scanner. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, I got nothing funny to say. I'm looking for something no, funny okay. to say, Scott. I got it's nothing okay. funny. But give me a couple minutes. I'll find no, something okay. smart to say. It's okay. No pressure. No pressure. Well, so we've been kind of circling around flow. You've referenced it lots of times. It's not an evening with the Flow Research Collective without us at least having one question about flow. So can you talk a little bit, because I saw this in the, the, the chat a few times, how does aging impact the frequency or intensity of flow experience? So this is awesome. This is awesome because it's literally Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's last study. Hmm. published posthumously. It was published, you did it with Gene Nakamura and somebody else. I'm forgetting who the third person is. Um, and his quest, and this was, so a lot in our country grew out of the, grew out of my last conversation with me, I checked sent me high before he died. And, um, it was about peak performance aging. And, um, at the time of the conversation, I didn't like, he had written about aging a lot because flow is one of the engines of maturation and adult development, but it didn't sort of dawn on me why until I saw this study, his last study was on flow proneness over time. He wanted to know. Do we stay as hungry, as eager for flow late in life as, as we are, as it is constant? And uh, what he found is that flow proneness and our desire for flow and all that stuff stays constant until the body starts to decay in such a way that you can no longer use your body to get into flow. And that's the only time it shifts. And in his research, it was like late 80s because that's as like that was the upper edge of the study group. And that's when bodies start falling apart, but that's really more of a reflection of where like current medical science is and, 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 and kind of longevity technology and longevity science than anything about flow. I think as, as we sort of expend, extend the healthy human lifespan out a little bit farther, flow proneness is gonna stay right up there. And, and Mike felt sort of the same way, um, which he insinuated in that like last conversation we had. And so how does this all 
how does this all relate to well-being, sense of purpose, fulfillment later in life? Because right? I know, Scott, you talk a lot about peak experiences in transcend as well. So what does this mean for the second half of life? Well, I think that's right. That That's just it. I talk about peak experiences. I uh, focus more on that than peak performance. And I think that at the end of the day, um, we, we probably spend more of our our uh, 20s to 40s obsessed with peak performance. And I think as we get older, we start to care more about the experiences of, in our lives. We care less about out-competing others. We care less about um, our social status, our ego, our um, you know, are leveling up <laughs> and more about flow, more about staying in the moment and finding what we're doing, whatever it is, meaningful. It, it, when you start to have a, a very um, meaningful conversation with someone, you know, it's not helpful to frame it in terms of, did I have peak performance <laughs> when I'm having a conversation with Dr. Tori? Did I dominate Tori in that conversation? What would that mean? You know, what would that mean? Why would that be valuable? if I dominated Tori in our conversation about something beautiful and meaningful, you know so, what I mean? That, that way of thinking just doesn't make sense. And, but I, a lot Scott, of I always yeah. thought of, I mean, when I talk about peak performance to me, it's just getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. I don't see it yeah. as dominating, right? I, I see it I as know. like, I know working with our biology. I'm not I, get your, you. I get your point <laughs> on this and your point is your point yeah. isn't like it's smart and it's right. And I, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about all of it is um, one of the, I think the big mistakes that people make about adulthood is they believe it's going to get easier. Mm. Some like it's, it's, which is like, I don't know why so many of us have this feeling that like, maybe it's just because we think we're going to get bad, like mastery increases over time. So we're, life is going to get easier. I don't think it gets any easier because even a master increases, you keep increasing the challenge level you know, or the sh shit's going to keep happening. It doesn't seem to get easier, but you're, it definitely gets more meaningful. Right. And that's the, um, and certainly we know Tori, the answer to your question, like even from blue zone research, successful aging research over and over and over again, you want to enjoy the second half of your life. You have to live with passion, purpose, and flow, right? Like that's, that's just really, really, really clear. But one of the other things about passion, purpose, and flow, I think is it, you know, that, lays down that that deeply meaningful life. I don't think life gets easier. And I think the idea is really dangerous, like telling yourself that it's going to get easier. You're just going to find yourself really frustrated with what life is offering you over time. But it is definitely going to get more meaningful. And, and that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. What I was saying is is quite consistent with um, the spirit of your book. There was a I wish I was trying to find the precise passage, but there's a moment I thought was so cool in the book where you found that that sort of peak performance part of you was activated when you were with someone. I, I believe it probably was with Ryan. You're like, how could I ever compete with with uh, someone 20 years younger than me? Blah, blah, blah. And then you said, and then I decided to just chill the fuck out and just enjoy the moment. Um, what, do you remember the passage I'm talking about? I don't, that's, I know what, what, I'm I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I definitely, cause I mean, look, I'm foundationally a very competitive person. I'm competitive about everything. Like in, in general, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very competitive. I just tend to be mostly competitive with myself, mm -hmm. right? Um, more than anything sure. else. And, and when I find myself competitive with other people, like it, first of all, it's, it's allowed, it's not going to work for me. Right. Like Ryan's a much more gifted athlete than I am. He's going to win. You know, I just thought it was a beautiful moment in the book. It perfectly illustrating, you know, a lot of the principles I try to teach people in, in our self-actualization coaching program is just um, focus on your own self-actualization. What does it even mean to self-actualize someone else's self? And why would you want to do that? <laughs> And so much, so much that jumped out to me there is part of peak performance aging isn't dominating. It's about setting goals that are growth oriented, right? That develop yeah. those master experiences that invite yeah. these opportunities to explore and be creative. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. So in our last few moments, any, any key takeaways or insights from the book that we haven't covered that you want to drop on our audience, even just to tease a little bit anywhere that we haven't covered. Man, we covered so much ground today. This this might have been one of our best, Stephen, uh, conversations on one of these 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 it events. Was fun. Too. 
that, that yeah. it, it was usually fun. Um, the only thing I want to say uh, that I don't think we covered, but um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it, is we talk a little about the superpowers of aging. You, Tori, you read that quote, right? The cognitive changes in the brain. What we didn't talk about is uh, there are moderators, certain things that you have to do each decade and other to unlock those uh, superpowers of aging. And in our 50s, if you really want access to them, you need creativity. It's the creative thinking that actually teaches the brain kind of this multi-perspectival thinking. All, all the changes in brain function are really unlocked. And this was this was very much Gene Cohn's research, um, are really unlocked by creative thinking. So creativity expands in adulthood, in, in, especially in our later years, a lot. But it's also you need creativity to unlock it. We see sort of the same thing in flow, right, where creativity is a flow trigger and flow produces more creativity and they feed on itself. Um, there's a, there's a sort of a feedback loop or an oscillation. Um, but you definitely see that with peak performance aging. And um, that's the only thing that uh, I wanted I wanted to mention earlier in the conversation and get a chance to mention. So uh, now my work here is done. Your yeah, work is done, and I, almost. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I and I will end. I will peace out by saying, you know, creativity when it, that can seem like such a, uh, I don't know, a, a daunting word to some people, but it, I view it as a way of being. I view it as an attitude in life, that a spirit, a creative spirit, and um, yeah, I think that's a lot of what we're talking about today, and a lot of what uh, well, Stephen's book illustrates is this creative spirit that he just pervaded everything that he did with trying to uh, defy age conventions and uh that's creativity that's a that's a way of being you know uh so i think if people can think of it more that way um then something just you know like do you have creativity or you don't have creativity you know it's it's just it's 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 a way of showing up to the world in your own existence and i just want to thank you uh doctor thank you dr tory <laughs> thank you ryan thank you dr tory ryan you've been a Steven. good sport thank you for Thank yeah. you for letting us drag you on to the podcast. Oh, SBK, thank you so much, man. It was an honor. Nice Get to meet you, man. You gentlemen, you Dr. Too. Notorious SBK. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.